Good evening, everybody. We're going to look at uh, a subject this evening, and whereas normally we would be able to chat a little about it uh, in groups if we were together in the building, um, possibly have, if you have a pen and paper, uh, just to jot down perhaps one or two thoughts uh, as we go through, not, to, not the thoughts, but the questions that um, I will bring for us to think about. So let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. And we just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable to you, O Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The most important thing to let people know and discover Jesus, mission, evangelism. It's what BMS World Mission is all about. And in the areas that they are working in, what would you expect? You would expect uh, church work, evangelism, people helping to build up the churches in different countries, healthcare and development to show the love of God. But there's one other that perhaps is a little bit less expected, and that is justice. Why would we put justice in the middle of bringing people to know Jesus? How would we look at justice? What does it mean to us? We hear perhaps mostly in legal terms. We hear people saying, I want justice, or I want it for me or for somebody else. I want the perpetrator or the guilty parties to be found and convicted because that will give me justice. But is that all that it means? Certainly sometimes it does, bringing justice to those without a voice, those who cannot stand up for themselves in a court of law. But it's within a much larger framework, the framework of the biblical concept of justice. Perhaps even it's not the first word that we would come up with in relation to the Bible or to God's priorities. And yet, as the first little task. As you read through your Bible over the days and weeks, look and see how often righteousness is linked with justice and justice and righteousness together linked with peace. The words for justice or injustice come many times in the Bible, so it's not an unimportant subject. We know those words from the prophet Micah well. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So to act justly, does that just mean obeying the law and supporting getting bad people into their, uh, to their just deserts? Biblical justice is shalom, is wholeness. Wholeness for individuals, for communities, and including the whole of creation. It involves goodness and impartiality. It is fairness in the way we treat others. It is part of our loving them. If we truly love someone or a community or God's world, we will seek fairness for them. We often hear, especially perhaps with children, but that's not fair. But perhaps as a second little task, can we look at, look back, perhaps at occasions when we have said that's not fair, and look at the number of times it was addressed that it was not fair to us, as against the number of times we recognised something was not fair to others, even uh, though it might be more than fair to us. Because looking at the biblical view of justice is more than an academic exercise. 
There are two biblical words translated justice. Mishpat is in the Old Testament more than 200 times. Its basic meaning is to treat people equitably, that they get the same penalty for the same wrong, whoever they are, or equally giving all people their rights equally. If we look in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 18, it's talking about the offerings for the priests and the Levites. This is the share due to the priests from the people who sacrifice a bull or a sheep. You are to give them the first fruits of your grain, new wine and oil, and the first wool from the shearing of your sheep. For the Lord your God has chosen them and their descendants out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the Lord's name always. The priests don't have their own land to farm, and so they have a right to food, to keep them alive, and so they are to live on the offerings brought for sacrifice. Those offerings are their right, their just reward. And Mishpat also involves treating those with no social power with justice. James, uh, we know well, says the same thing in chapter 2. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law, as lawbreakers. It's not just that it's good to do this. The Bible tells us it's a sin not to. Mishpat is more perhaps to do with the legal side of justice, with exerting pressure to see the poor and the powerless have unequal access to justice in the courts. And the justice or otherwise, justness or otherwise of a society is shown by how the poor, the vulnerable, the voiceless are treated. To do justice, as Micah says, is to defend those with the least social and economic power. And they are repeatedly referred to in the Old Testament. The widows, the orphans, the aliens, the immigrants, who, including the immigrants, were to be treated equally, to be treated justly. Again, in your reading, another little task, see how often those three groups are mentioned in the Old Testament to be cared for and defended. And this is important because it reflects God's character. Psalm 68 tells us that he is a father to the fatherless, the defender of widows. The second word, Tzadikah is about being just, being righteous in day-to-day -day living. Living in relationships that are fair, generous, equitable. And it's said that if Tzadikah is lived out fully and properly, Mishpat will not be needed. There will be no need for punishment. There will be no need to care for victims of unjust treatment because there will be no injustice. There will be absolute justice in action. And this tzaddika grows from our primary relationship, that is, our relationship with God. Again, we go back to Deuteronomy. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. 
He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. That relationship that we have with a just God and that Sadika grows from that. But it's also that relationship lived out in a deeply and fully social way. One of the marks of living justly is radical generosity. Being just, Sadika is lived out doing justly, giving those in need their rights to equal care and protection. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. This is Tzadika. As we walk in humble, obedient relationship with our God, so we will live in right relationships with others, relationships that are just, righteous, godlike. There are many passages relating to this aspect of biblical truth. I am not covering this in the context in, of God's justice towards sin or judgment, because that has been covered so well recently. But how are we to live out God's justice and righteousness in our lives? Right from the beginning of the Bible, following God and being blessed in it involves living justly. Back in Genesis chapter 18, the men had come to Abraham and promised him a child. After the men, are, as the men are leaving, then the Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So doing right and justly comes with that promise. Moving on to Leviticus, in Leviticus 19, some of the verses that we often read at harvest, but there is more to it than that. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Don't steal, don't lie, don't deceive one another. Don't swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbour or rob him. Don't hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not pervert, oh sorry, do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favouritism to the great, but judge your neighbour fairly. Do not go about sl spreading slander among your people. Don't do anything that endangers your neighbour's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbour frankly so that you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. This is Tadika, being just in relationships. These are not suggestions. These are not nice ideas if you can manage it on a good day. These are what are called command decrees. They are equivalent to the Ten Commandments. They have the same force. Several, as you'll have noticed, are the same. Don't lie, don't steal, don't deceive one another. 
All these commands come from God himself. I am the Lord your God. And they reflect his character of love. So his people are to love their neighbours as themselves. These are rights and obligations between the Israelites in relationship as part of their covenant with God. And that comes down to us too as his people. In loving their neighbour and so loving God in obedience, God's people are to live justice, uh, live justly, to leave some of their abundance for others. Or maybe in a bad year, even some of what they need. Because there's no let out clause about, well, you can leave it if you have more than enough. They were to leave some of their harvest for the poor and the alien, because if they didn't have enough, then the poor and the alien would have had even less. Treating them with justice by giving them their rights. Don't hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Give him his right in a day wage economy, as we know even today. People can live often just hand to mouth. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, when you make a loan of any kind to your neighbour, do not go into his house to get what he is offering as a pledge. Stay outside. Let the man to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the man is poor, don't go to sleep with his pledge in your possession. Return his cloak to him by sunset so that he may sleep in it. Then he will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Don't take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he's a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise he may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Take care, even when somebody owes you something. Take care of them. Make sure they still have their right to something to eat and something warm to sleep in. As in Leviticus, no partiality, be just and fair. And this is the character of God, who, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God who loves without partiality. This challenge from God to his people to live justly in relationship with him and others carries on throughout the Old Testament. In Psalm 82, God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. The gods, earthly rulers and judges, as well as possibly pagan deities. But the accusation is that they, the rulers, are evil because they are not doing their job. In the Old Testament, the, a priority for the rulers was to protect the powerless against oppression. They had responsibility for mishpat justice. Proverbs 31. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And the rulers in Psalm 82 were doing the opposite, defending the unjust and showing partiality to the wicked. They're not following God's rule because they're not showing his concern for justice. And so God makes his demand in that psalm. Get on with it. Defend the cause of the weak. Maintain the rights. Look out 
for those who can't speak up for themselves. And it demonstrates that it's not just good to live justly, but God regards it as a sin not to live justly. Job is talking to his friends. He's trying to work things out and saying, if I'd done this, if I'd done this, if I'd been lustful, if I'd done that, if I'd done the other, you know, then fair enough. And in that list, talking about justice, the verses about justice are far more than all the other potential sins. If I've denied justice to my men servants and maid servants when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? God thinks this is important. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or a needy man without a garden, garment and his heart did not bless me for warming him with the fleece from my sheep. If I've raised my hand against the fatherless knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder, let it be broken off at the joint for I dreaded destruction from God. For fear of his splendour, I could not do such things. Not sharing with the poor is unrighteousness and a violation of God's justice. Radical generosity is a sign of living justice. Of living justice to all because they are God's people. They are created by him as we are. And so we go on into the prophets, Isaiah. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right. Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the, of the widow. And then those wonderful words. Come, let us reason. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be like snow. That despite whatever we do, whatever are our sins, God is willing to forgive and to restore us. But what Isaiah is saying is that doing the religious stuff is not what God wants if there is no living justly as well. Calls for social justice are emphasised by that short, sharp style, stressing God's authority and the urgency of his commands. The responsibility placed on rulers to make justice their priority is shown as well in Jeremiah chapter 22. This is what the Lord says, go down to the palace of the king of Judah and proclaim this message there. Hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, you who sit on David's throne, you, your officials, and your people who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of his oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Don't shed innocent blood in this place. For if you're careful to carry out these commands, then kings who sit on David's thrones, throne will come through the gates of this palace, riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by their officials and their people. But if you don't obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this palace will become a ruin. There are lots of other things that could have been put in there, but it's those commands that determine the future of David's lineage. And in verse 13, woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his countrymen work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. Is not that what 
It means to know me, says God. To love God fully with all our heart and mind and soul is to love our neighbour. Living a life of tzaddika, being just and righteous, living in just relationships with others, do no wrong or violence to the alien, the fatherless, the widow, defend them, don't let anyone else do them wrong either. There is no passing by on the other side from God's word through Jeremiah. Read Amos, not a mincer of words either. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. And who are they? They are women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. On and on the list of their many offences and their great sins in many ways. But repeatedly, the lack of lived out justice. Again, we see how God is not interested in religious stuff if it's only skin deep. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-flowing stream. And all this because justice is God's character. Words that we will hear again in a few weeks at Christmas from Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Oh, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The effect of the spirit on the servant is righteousness and justice. For the wicked, indeed, but for the poor as well. In Isaiah later on, Isaiah chapter 58, uh, we know well when God challenges his people Oh, we're fasting and you're not blessing us, Lord. You know, it's not fair. Uh, you should be blessing us because we're doing the right thing. And God says, and what is your definition of fasting when you are being so unjust to the people around you? Why have we fasted when you have not seen it? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit your workers. And on and on. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? to loose the chains of injustice, entire the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed, pressed free, share your food with the hungry, provide the poor wanderer with shelter, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. And then in the following chapter, we discover the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. That's his character. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. God's character revealed again as he intervenes on behalf of those who are unjustly treated. As we are blessed because he intervened in his own son. Because there was no one else who could speak for us. We have at the judgment nothing that we can say, but his own son came in order, uh, as God intervenes, to bring justice and righteousness, forgiveness, new life to us. And as we move on into the New Testament, we see both Mishpat and Sadiqa in Jesus. 
justice against sin, just, and lived out justice and righteousness in his relationships of care for the powerless, the oppressed, the voiceless, lived out as well as spoken about. Jesus demonstrates that justice and righteousness, living justice to make things right. We see again this word about relationships as Jesus models justice in his right relationships, first and foremost with his Father God, then with others, and as the wind and waves obey him and as he will ultimately restore it all, his right relationship with creation. Yes, he demonstrates that justice is necessary for our sinfulness, that a penalty needs to be paid. But he also looks for that right, just way of living. He demonstrates it in all that he does. And Jesus reminds his hearers of the right order of things, the right order of relationships. The first and greatest commandment is to love God. But we can't pick and choose our commandments. And the second, he says, is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. He loved those on the margins and showed it in his actions. He acted justly and spoke of justice as one of the more important matters of the law. As he was speaking to the Pharisees and going through the things uh, that he was not happy with, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. The Pharisees weren't wrong to tithe, but wrong to raise that over the most central tenets of God's law. They had fo failed to focus on the spirit of the law, on primarily on God's will. Jesus demonstrated just fairness as he raised the status of women and children, gave them dignity, gave them a position within society, honoured the widow who had only two coins to rub together, but who practised justice in her sacrificial generosity. He told the outcast tax collector Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Salvation didn't come because he'd paid back money. But Zacchaeus, as he puts his trust in Jesus, has become a true Jew, one who follows in Abraham's faith. And he has then demonstrated that new relationship by starting to act justly in relationship to others. First comes that change of heart as he follows Jesus, which uh, has brought him salvation and has become a true son of Abraham. But immediately he demonstrates it by acting justly. And we see that too in the life of the new young church in Acts, where finding new life through trusting in Jesus laid, led to concern for others. And where, when um, they were trying to do it, uh, but in a wrong way, there were consequences. Jesus fulfills God's words again through Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. We see again the Spirit's effect on God's servant that he will proclaim justice even to the nations. And he will proclaim God's character of righteousness and justice for the good of everyone. Not denying sinfulness, but expanding um, 
what justice means. What a wonderful picture of living justly, so that no harm comes to the weak and the frail, the weary, the oppressed, the poor, the outcast and the broken. But instead, they are accepted and welcomed and cared for in love and lifted up. There is so much more, particularly as we look into the life of Jesus and watch his relationships with God and with others. But you can ask yourselves, have I just picked the parts of the Bible that fit the thesis? Which is where those little tasks come in. We need always to go and look and then judge for ourselves. God is just and righteous, and it's expressed in both Mishpat, including judgment, and in Tzadikah, living justly in right relationships, first and above all with God, then with others and with God's creation. What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy while walking humbly with your God? If this is so, Is it more than an academic exercise? And if it is, how do we learn to live justly so that others are treated fairly and have their rights? How does acting justly in relation to others affect every aspect of our lives? How can when we recognize it's not fair when it's it's not fair to others? When those who contribute least to global warming suffer most of the effects? Can I live more justly by putting on an extra jumper and turning the heating down? It was certainly not fair to overseas garment workers when British companies refused to pay for work that the garment workers had already done because their sales in the UK had fallen because of the lockdown. How can we act justly for those workers? How can the poor access justice? That's where BMS comes in, helping people to have their rights to land or to whatever it is, showing the love of God through justice in the courts, showing God's love locally. Peter has uh, talked to us about living justly in our local community, shopping locally, caring for those who serve us in our local community. How do we live sacrificially with sacrificial generosity for the good of others. Because it can't just be an academic exercise, but has to be lived out in our daily lives. First and foremost, and above all, love the Lord your God, who gave us so much more than justice in forgiveness through the death and resurrection of Jesus. If we had been treated with legal justice, we would not be here. But in his love for us, in his righteousness and faithfulness, he has treated us justly with love. And in response to that great love for us, let us also seek to love our neighbours as ourselves, to act justly, to love mercy as we walk humbly with our God. Father, we thank you that even as you challenge us by your word, you are already giving us promises. Those promises that as we seek to love and serve you, you are with us and you will give back to us so much more than we ever give to you or to others. We pray for justice, for your justice in relationships not only with us, we pray for that in governance and in the relationships between nations, that those who have will not hold on to what they have, but will be willing to share in justice and love and mercy with others. Father God, we pray that your kingdom of righteousness and justice 
will come on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray in the name of him who brings it, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.